Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to be working on the Corvette yet again. You guys will actually see that the car is torn apart. And uh, we're, we're kind of waiting on parts right now. You'll see that the cooling system is still out and uh, we're waiting on some stuff for that. So today we're gonna to be working on the engine monitoring side of things because we really have no idea what's going on with the car. So this problem started about a year ago when the car failed on the dyno and we lost fuel pressure. And the car really has no way to tell you much anything besides like oil pressure, temperature. I don't think it says trans temp, not in the manual. Uh, engine coolant temp, you know, all the basics. So I needed something that could kind of tie in both aftermarket gauges and fuel pressure regulator, stuff like that, as well as what could tell me what's going on in the stock computer. So I found this product called an Aeroforce Interceptor, and this is what it is. It's your standard, I think it's two and five sixteenths gauge. I might be wrong on the size there, but what this does is it actually has an OBD2 port on the back of it. So this will allow you to connect to the factory PCM via the OBD2 port. And, uh, you know, that'll display any information that's on the factory computer, oil pressure, fuel pressure, uh, E85 ethanol content. So we've added a sensor for that. Um, you know, anything in regards to that, as well as it allows you to tie in up to two aftermarket gauges or sensors. So this is the gauge and we're going to get this installed in the car. Now on the inside of the car, you guys might be wondering, how are we going to mount the gauge? Well, there are a ton of different options. You can go full race car with a A-pillar with like two or three gauges on it. They may sell a single, I'm not really sure. SLP sells a gauge that goes around the gauge cluster on the driver's side, but it's $100 for a very bad piece that does not fit well. I have seen complaint after complaint after complaint where they either needed to trim it, they needed to like modify it heavily, or there's a third option which was real cheap is to get a 3D printed gauge bezel. You know, you can either screw it or double side tape it to the side of the gauge cluster and you'll have your little gauge bezel. Now I got this off of Corvette forums. I had forgotten the guy's name. I, I bought this a while back. This was only like 25 or $30 and he 3D printed to what side I wanted. He does. So that's what we end up going with. And the third part of this is going to be what aftermarket, you know, gauge accessories are we going to be running with the Air Force Interceptor. Well, the first is actually gonna be a fuel pressure sensor. You know, we already have one in the car. We have one over there in the fuel rail, but we're gonna take that one off and put this one in because this is specifically calibrated for the Air Force Interceptor. And that other one, it was like a $30 gauge off Amazon. This was a little bit more expensive and I want something that is highly accurate. So we've got a fuel pressure gauge to install. And you also can see that we have a O2 sensor here. This is a wideband O2 sensor from Bosch, and this will just allow us to monitor our air fuel ratios, you know, keep us safe whether we're rich or lean, and uh, let us know what's going on with the air fuel se setup. So these are the aftermarket gauges that we're going to install today. So we have finished the install of the sending unit for the fuel pressure monitoring system. As you guys will see, I took the 90 degree fitting that's coming out of the fuel pressure regulator and I put the fuel sending unit sensor right there, the fuel pressure sensor right there. Then I just ran the wiring underneath and this will go off into the car. So that is gonna be the wiring and the sensor for the fuel pressure sensor. All right guys, I just got the plug out with really no issue. If you guys could see on there, that's the black carbon from the exhaust obviously. But if you guys see on the side, there is a layer of anti-seize on here. When I installed these like six or seven years ago, I vaguely remember putting anti-seize on here. So that really saved my bacon today. As you guys can see, I did not have to drop the exhaust at all. We still, we're still connected to the headers here. The X-pipe is still connected to the back, to the mufflers in the back. And uh, this O2 bong came out with no issue. I did soak it with WD-40, got a little can of it over there, sprayed it down with WD-40, and then I just put my real big wrench, this big wrench right here on it, and I was able to get just enough room under here to get my wrench on there and loosen it, push it toward the back, and this O2 sensor bung came right out. So if you guys are ever doing exhaust work and you have like bungs like that, take it out, put anti-seize on it, and you never know, down the road, that might save your bacon. So 
we're gonna go ahead and get the O2 sensor installed and go from there. All right guys, as you can see, we have the O2 sensor installed for the wideband and I ran the wiring just over the pipe for now. Obviously, you know, we have to determine where to run this into the car, but I did want to show you the O2 sensor installed down here. And also we did use some anti-seize. You know guys, there's a meme out there about anti-seize and you kind of turn into looking like the Tin Man. I applied just a little bit of the anti-seize and guys that ended up all over my hands, all over the bottle, all over the exhaust and all over the O2 sensors. So yeah, that meme is uh, real. <laughs> I can totally relate to it in real life. So. so that is the wideband O2 sensor installed. Obviously, like I said, we didn't have to do any welding on this setup. The Cook's X pipe has it and uh, they came with a wideband already installed in it. So that's pretty cool. I appreciate those guys for doing that already because it saved us a lot of time trying to figure out where to put an extra wideband sensor. So, and for the LS motors guys, you know, we've got an O2 sensor on top of the headers up here. Here's our wideband O2 sensor and then the ones after the cats. All right guys, now that we've got the sensors installed, it's time to move on. What does WD-40, a coat hanger, a roll of electrical tape and a small needle screwdriver? So what does that equal? That equals a good time. No, I'm just kidding guys. I used all of these tools to get the wiring fished through the firewall on the Corvette. I ended up attaching the wiring harness that we had to push through the firewall. I ended up using a coat hanger for that. I taped it with some electrical tape and then I ended up using WD-40 and I just hosed off, kind of lubricated the whole taped section. And I used that to push the wiring. I actually ended up using it to pull the wiring through the firewall grommet. There's a grommet over on the driver's side for the hood latch release and I ended up pulling it through there. And uh, I did that twice. I also ended up depending the O2 harness for the wideband sensor. I'll show you a picture of that here. As you guys can see, we have the green wire pulled out. I ended up depending it because I ended up needing to get that end of the wire into the car and through the firewall. And there's no way you're gonna get the pigtail, like that big giant plastic pigtail on the sensor side that plugs into the sensor. There's no way you're gonna get that through the firewall. So I just depend the harness side, ran it in through the firewall, like I said. And so that will eventually end up plugging into the wideband O2 sensor control box. So let's show you where we pull the wires through on the car and we'll go from there. All right guys, so you will end up seeing the kind of harness back here and you'll see these two black wires. These two black wires that I um, have in my hand, the thicker one is the wideband O2 harness and the skinnier one, this is the harness for the fuel pressure sensor. And we ran these two wires through this grommet back here. I'm not sure if you guys will be able to see that. Yeah, I think you can see that. You'll see actually more wires run through there. It's because we've got other projects, you know, going on, other wiring that we've had run through. But I did manage to get the two sensor wire harnesses run through the firewall through this grommet. And I ended up hooking those two wire harnesses to the coat hanger by actually pushing the coat hanger from the inside of the car outside and then I taped it and then I pulled it back. But now when I taped it and attached it to the other end, like I said, I did spray it down with WD-40. That lubricated enough to where I could just grab it, uh, come back to the inside of the car, pull it, and I was able to pull the harness right through. So we should be good there. And uh, that's how I ended up getting both those harnesses through. All right guys, here's the 3D printed gauge pod. As you guys can see, it has a very matte finish. That is because wet sanded it with 220 grit then I wet sanded it with 320 grit. Now we're gonna get ready to paint this with some SEM trim black. All right guys, you'll see that the gauge pod is covered in primer. I did a real light dusting coat of primer on it and now we're gonna do the SEM trim black paint on it. Now before we did this, we did use plastic adhesion promoter. We did a small dusting coat of that and then a heavier coat and then I did a primer coat on it, like I said, I'll lay dusting a primer. And then I finished up by spraying two or three layers of SEM satin trim black paint.
And here is the finished gauge pod. As you guys can see, it is mostly satin black, and I think this should match the interior very well. But I will say this, there are some deep, it's actually not scratches for me sanding it. There are some deep marks in the paint that you guys can kind of see in some of the corners. Well, that is actually from the 3D printing process itself. And when I wet sanded this, I didn't want to go down any further into the material. Because as you guys can see, this is super thin. So if you guys tried to dig out every little imperfection, the, you would lose the structural integrity of this piece. So while it may not be perfect, honestly guys, you're not going to see like 90% of this. Because, you know, the gauge is going to be in front of it taking up most of the room. And it's good enough. Is it perfect? No. But for... 30 bucks or whatever I paid for this, you know, I'm not going to have an issue with it. And yes, he could have taken the time and put some body filler in and a little bit of Bondo and wet sand and all that, you know, for spending like 30 minutes getting it smooth by just sanding it. And then like another, I don't know, 30 minutes painting it with adhesion promoter primer and paint. It's not bad. Like I, I can't complain about this at all. So... Let's go ahead and get this installed on the car. Now, earlier in the video, we kind of went over the gauge that we're going to be using, that Air Force gauge. And that gauge requires a lot of wiring to go in the car. So we actually have a number of things that we need to wire up for this project. First is the fuel pressure gauge. So we'll have that. that we've already installed the sensor. You guys saw that. We have the wideband sensor to wire up. You guys saw that installed. And the third part we have to do is basically provide power source for all these accessory gauges. And Unfortunately, the wide band requires two 12 volt sources and the fuel pressure gauge requires its own source. So I was actually running out of wiring, you know, switch 12 volt sources inside the car. And as you guys can see on the ground, we kind of have a hodgepodge of wiring. So what we're gonna be doing is actually adding another fuse panel into the car. And as you guys can see, there are six ports here. So we'll be able to add actually six 12 volt sources to the car and how we're gonna do this is pretty simple. You guys can see the red wiring kind of going over here to the end. There is a ring terminal on one of them. There actually will be a ring terminal on both. But basically, since our battery is back in the back corner of the car, what we're able to do is pull source directly from the battery. We're going to have a fused source on both of these. So we've got a fuse on both lines. And then we're going to have them come into these Bosch style five pin relays. And by adding these relays, we're going to be able to tell the car not to run these accessories all the time. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a tap a fuse tied into the fuse panel under the passenger side floorboard. So that will give you your, tool, your, your switch source that will go into the relay. And on the other side, there's going to be a ground. So this black wire will be a ground. The blue wire coming in is going to be our power source. And then in this case, the yellow wire is basically the accessory we're trying to power. Now you guys might be wondering, well, why are you running two relays, two separate wires, and all, and two different fuses for one fuse block? Well, the reason we had to do that was because this fuse block actually is split into three fuses each. So the first one has powers three, and the second one powers three. So as you guys can see on the output here, you know, kind of the, the red wire and the red and solid red wire we're pulling into, that will actually power only three of these fuse terminals. So for us to get the full six terminals, we had to run a second wire, second relay, second fuse. So we're actually going to stick the fuse box down in here. We've got this little cubby hole we can stick down there. The relays and everything will kind of just lay back in there too, and we'll run the wiring back to the battery. So that's actually going to be the power source for everything we have to tie into. And like I said, we have to already run three additional switch 12 volt sources for this gauge setup. So that kind of sucks, and that's why we end up with this wiring harness. So we actually just finished the install of the sub harness that we created. I'll show you what it looks like. If you guys can see down there in the cavity below the, I'm not sure if that's a body control module or a computer, you'll see the additional fuse panel that we had put in. And now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty detail of this wiring job. Now I actually have been out here, This we're going on D3. I think I was out of here for like five or six hours yesterday two or three hours the night before. And then the night before that, I think I created that sub harness. That took like an hour or two. So, man, guys, we have at least, 
on the low end, 10 to 15 hours in this wiring job. That might be a little high, but at least 10 hours, probably more like 12. So here is the information that I got from Air Force and how we wired it into the car. As for the wiring job itself, for the gauges, the wideband, the fuel pressure sensor, we actually had four different documents that Air Force provides you, but they don't have an actual wiring diagram. It's just, it's spelled out, it's written out, and there might be a few small diagrams, but it's not big picture. It doesn't give you an overall diagram of what you're trying to do. So I drew everything out, double checked it, everything seems to be working, and I'm gonna share that with you guys. So to help save you guys a bunch of time trying to figure out this wiring, I will actually take a picture of this. I will upload it to my Dropbox and I'll share it in a link down below. It's actually where I have all my LSA documentation for the SS, but uh, anyway. So here is your two basic setups. You have a fuel pressure sensor and you have your wideband sensor. So you got your two sensors and basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect our sensors to the gauge. Going up top, your fuel pressure sensor has three lines coming out of it. Black, blue, and red. Black is a ground, so we ran that in to the interior and grinded it out. Blue is going to be the power line for the fuel pressure sensor. You know, that runs into the interior as well. You wire a 470 ohm resistor in, and then that goes to the back of the gauge. So that's going to be your input number one. For power for the gauge, you actually run the red wire coming out of it. It connects to a green wire that's on a 5 volt regulator. I do have the regulator installed. And then coming out of the regulator, the regulator has another ground and it has its own power source. And so red wire goes to a 2 amp fuse or a switch 12 volt source. So now we're going to do the O2 sensor side. You actually have a control box that's actually buried in the car. It's down by the tunnel. You basically have three harnesses that plug into this control box. One harness is the O2 sensor itself. Second harness is the output. Basically, that's going to go into your gauge. Your output harness has three wires in it, black, brown, and green. The black and green are not used, so just tape them off, tape them out of the way, and send your brown wire into the back of the gauge, and that is over on the driver's side. Now, the power side of the O2 sensor has a four wire harness and this one is pretty simple. So coming out of your box, you got the power harness, you got black, white, orange, and red. Black connects to ground, white connects to switch 12 volt source, orange is not used so tape that one off, and red connects to your switch 12 volt source. So we basically have three switch 12 volt sources that you need to add power to. So red, white, that's coming out of the power harness for the O2 sensor, and then the red coming out of the regulator for the fuel pressure sensor. So those are your three powers and your grounds are actually three. There's gonna be three grounds. One coming out of the fuel pressure sensor itself, two coming out of the regulator itself, and three will be coming out of the power harness for the O2 sensor. All right, so now that we've talked about the gauge, the wiring, the fuse panel, the sub harness and all that, let's get in the car and fire this thing up and show you what it looks like. All right guys, as you can see, the gauge is fully installed. You can go through the menus, various temperatures. Now I haven't set any of this up, but these are your various gauges and different things that you can set up. All right, so you just saw the successful operation of the gauge working in the car and us not having a problem with it. I really have only run into two problems with this whole project. One is the O2 sensor in the fuel pressure gauge the, uh, the configuration is kind of a pain in the butt, and I didn't really pay attention which uh, input is going to which, so I've configured it. It's throwing numbers at me, but they don't make any sense, so I need to do more research on the configuration for the gauges. And if we find anything major, I'll film a follow-up video and go over that. The other problem that we ran into was the line lock, for whatever reason, only works when the car is in reverse. So that's a little bit of a weird problem with the line lock only working in reverse. I'll have to look at the wiring diagram for that. I don't understand why just moving the fuse panel, you know, from having a tap of fuse to that fuse in the fuse panel, that it's only working in reverse. So that's gonna be it for this video. I know it's probably a long one, but what you guys need to realize is I have been working on parts of this video for five or six weeks. I had installed the wideband sensor, that was several weeks ago. I had installed the fuel pressure sensor. 
I had to run all those wiring into the harness. And then I actually had to paint the gauge itself. I've been working on this wiring for the last weekend. And finally we wrapped everything up. So it's been a real long project getting this thing wired up for this stupid little gauge. But hopefully it works. Hopefully we get everything figured out. And like I said, if we run into anything major, we'll obviously do an update and do a follow-up video. But yeah, that's going to be it for today. And this actually should be it for the Corvette. If we have any other videos, I apologize on that. But as far as I know, everything's done. We've put everything on. We've put the car back together. Ventilation, cooling, all that stuff's done. And uh, this gauge project and the wiring project was the last thing I needed to do. So we'll start testing the car out. We'll go on some test drives. Uh, we'll try to share that in the video if we can. And then we'll call up PCM and say, hey, we're ready for the dyno. So make sure you guys hit that subscribe button. Make sure you hit the, your bell notification button as well. That way you guys can see this dyno video that's been almost a year and a half in the making. Wow, that's crazy, but that is true. So like I said, that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want to help support the channel, click all the links down below. Make sure you check out our website, bonecrusherss.com. Thanks guys, have a great one. Yeah.